Добрый день, уважаемые, или доброго времени суток. У нас доброе утро в Англии. Спасибо большое, что проявили интерес к нашей сессии. Сегодняшний наш спикер – это Рэйчел Хамфри. Она является соведущей и продюсером ежедневного подкаста «The Guardian» – «Today in Focus». Это один из самых популярных подкастов в Великобритании, а в прошлом году он был назван «Best Current Affairs Podcast» на церемонии вручения награды British Podcast Awards. Рэйчел проработала в аудиожурналистике почти 10 лет и сейчас живет в Лондоне. Меня зовут Дельмурат Юсупов. Я также сейчас нахожусь в Великобритании, в городе Брайтоне. Я сегодня буду модерировать сессию с Рэйчел. I will speak in English. Рэйчел uh, Humphries at Uh, well, uh, let's welcome Rachel Humphries today. Uh, she is the co-presenter and the producer of the Guardian, for The Guardian's daily podcast, Today in Focus. It's one of the most listened podcasts in the UK. And last year, she was, it was named as the best current affairs podcast at the British Podcast Awards. Uh, Rachel has worked in audio journalism for nearly a decade, and now she lives in London. So welcome, Rachel. Um, we oh, will have... Yeah, sorry. Hi, <laughs> thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that we have our session today will be in English, but it will also be uh, simultaneously interpreted into Russian. So in order to choose Russian, you need to go to the globe icon uh, at the bottom of your Zoom and, and you should choose Russian as a language. But if you want to listen to the session in English, you are welcome to do so, so you can listen in English. And uh, I also wanted to mention that our session is now live on Facebook, uh, the Facebook page of the school Kabar. So you can also watch our live session, li session live in, on Facebook as well. So uh, sorry for talking too much, but uh, yeah, welcome Rachel again. So I, I gave the floor to you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you spoke too much at all, Dora. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, it's amazing to be here and amazing to speak to so many of you um, in a very different part of the world from me. I'm in my bedroom, as you can see, in London, which is where I've been watching for nearly a year now um, because of the pandemic. And I'll talk a bit about that and how we're managing to make a podcast from home as well at the moment, which is quite a challenge, as you can imagine. Um, And I'll, I'll talk for a bit and then I think we might have some time for questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, then wait till the end and hopefully I can answer some of them. But I've got a presentation that I've made here. Let me see if I can share my screen with you. And hopefully everyone can see this uh, in a second. Okay, so as um, Dilmarod said in, in his lovely intro, um, I work on a podcast called Today in Focus, which is a daily podcast from the Guardian newspaper in the UK. Uh, we put out five episodes a week and we launched back at the end of 2018. Um, and as you said, I myself have worked in audio for nearly 10 years. I started in live radio, working in phone in radio, and then working for major broadcasters like the BBC. Um, but as the podcast market grew in the UK, it's huge here now, there are millions of podcasts in the UK, um, I've moved into making podcasts as a lot of audio producers have, um, and have been at Today in Focus since it launched at the end of 2018, um, and it's a great job, I'm very lucky to be able to do it, and we get to tell amazing stories every day, so I'm going to try and explain today how we make complicated content and analytical news stories interesting, how we make them engaging for people and why we have such a loyal base of fans who love listening to news in the way that we do it basically. Um, so what is Today in Focus first of all, a bit more detail on what we actually are. So we launched as I say at the end of 2018 And the aim of the podcast is to take listeners behind our news stories that our journalists are covering every day to give people more access to the kind of things that we're writing about. Um, and when we launched, we looked like this. This was our logo when we came out in November 2018. And the 
format of the podcast is it's one story told each day for about 20, 25 minutes. And for the first year and a bit of our podcast, we also had a separate comment section at the end, which was for a few minutes. And that was to offer some sort of opinion and to be able to cover a couple of stories. But we now focus just on one and we find it works really well to be in depth on one story. Um, and I can talk a bit later about why I think that works in podcasting and why there's such a trend for that in podcasting particularly. Um, so our host is, our main host is a woman called Anushka Astana and I co-host the podcast with Anushka. Uh, Anushka had not hosted a podcast before. She was a political editor, but she had done a lot of broadcasting and she is the, as I say, the lead, the lead host of the podcast. And I'll talk a bit about her later and how important she is to audiences connecting with what we do and also connecting with the way that we tell stories. Um, and the idea of, of this podcast essentially beyond just giving people access to our journalism was to target that person who might want news on the move. So perhaps on the commute in the work, into work you know, making a podcast that's kind of 20, 25 minutes means it's perfect, right, for your training to work or your morning walk or while you're having a coffee. Um, and so those are the kinds of people that we're hitting. You know, the podcast comes out every morning early into podcast feeds. It's on all the major podcast platforms, you know, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts. There are lots more as well, Pocket Cast. Um, and it's on all of those, as well as being on the front page of the Guardian website. So it's quite a prominent part of what the Guardian does. Um, I mean, the Guardian has made podcasts for over 15 years. It's quite unusual for newspapers in the UK. It has invested in audio for a long time because they know it's a good way of pulling in new audiences. And I think the word podcast was actually first written in the Guardian. <laughs> A really long time ago one of our writers was trying to come up with a name for this new thing you know these audio clips where people were sharing online and he came up with the word podcast and I'm pretty sure that was the first time anyone had used the word so we like to claim that as our own um, as kind of inventing the word podcast in in that sense um, so before we launched in end 2018 there was a big team of us working to kind of design what the podcast would be. We spent many hours working out how the format would work. And then we launched in November. Um, and this is what we look like now. We've changed a bit. We've kind of upgraded, I suppose, in some ways. Um, and I just thought I would play for you quickly a little clip of the first ever episode that we broadcast, which was an interview with our South America correspondent, Tom Phillips who is based in Brazil and it was about at the time Brazil's new president then Jair Bolsonaro and what he meant and what it meant that he had become president of Brazil so I'll just play this little clip here so you can kind of hear if you've not heard the podcast what it sounds like um, and hopefully you can just get a sense of that. Just months after being written off, Jair Bolsonaro swept to power on Sunday. A man who's praised dictatorships and defended torture is about to become the next president of Brazil. The fourth biggest democracy in the world has been conquered by the far right. From The Guardian, I'm Anushka Astana. Today in Focus, who is Jair Bolsonaro? And how did he persuade more than 50 million people to vote for him? We don't. So you can hear there our um, music and you can hear Anushka. And that's what all of our intros to the podcast basically sound like. And you can hear how the title of the podcast, Today in Focus, means we can ask a question at the beginning of every episode. And I'll talk in a bit about how important that actually is to how we structure our episodes and how we focus what we think about. Um, just briefly, I mean, Dimrod has, has kindly mentioned quite a lot of this already. The podcast has grown hugely since we launched. I think we've all been amazed by how well people have received it. And it shows that there is a big appetite, not just in the UK, but all over the world 
for daily news um, and for news podcasts. So we are one of the most listened to podcasts in the UK and we're definitely one of the most listened to news podcasts in the UK. Um, and we have been nominated for lots of awards and won a British podcast award last year. Um, I should just say the British podcast awards have grown a lot and it again just shows how big podcasting is here now that there is an whole awards ceremony and you know maybe as podcasting grows in Central Asia that is something that will develop there too if there's not already but it's it's been huge here um so that was a a, a great win for us and has, has helped us enormously um and it also means we get to put this cool logo on our branding now but you know it's always nice to to win things um and we also have an audience that's growing year on year I think we've had a sort of 50% increase between 2019 and 2020 on our listeners, and that's going up all the time. I know that we have a small and growing audience in Central Asia as well, um, but it would be great for us to be able to, to grow that. And I think hopefully uh, that's an area that we can tell more stories from in the next year. So of course, if anyone has got suggestions for stories that we could be covering, we're always keen to hear about them. We're always keen to see how we can tell them in audio uh, for new audiences, which I think would be really exciting. Um, how we make the podcast was what I was going to talk about next and the process of how we put it together. Um, so it's a great team that we get to work with, first of all. We have a large team that has grown since we started. I think, you know, a, a lot of you and a lot of people who make podcasts may be just doing it on their own. Um, and, and I know how hard that can be when you're working on something on your own, but something like this, where we're putting out essentially five mini documentaries a week takes quite a lot of people. So this is a picture of our team uh, last year. That was at an award ceremony. I think that's actually the last time any of us went out before the pandemic. So it's quite a sad photo now for us. But um, this is all of our team. And you can see this is a collection of our producers, our executive producers, and a very important person to our sound, our team is our sound designer, Axel, who is really the person that obviously makes it sound amazing, but really sets us apart, I think, from other podcasts and helps to make those stories engaging. Um, so yeah, we have a group of producers who basically um, set up the interviews, edit the interviews, do all the research, all of that kind of thing. We have executive producers who oversee the whole podcast. They're working out all the time what episodes we should be making, our timetable, our schedules, that kind of thing. Um, and then obviously we have Anushka and I who are presenting or sharing the presenting. And then we have a sound designer who takes the episode every day and sound designs it. Um, so we are based usually here in our central London office, The Guardian. Obviously at the moment we're not, and we have been making the podcast at home for a year. I mean, I'm literally sat where I record script every day with this microphone, um, which is sometimes not, not easy. And I did start the pandemic broadcasting from a tent uh, in my bedroom because it helped with the sound quality, but luckily I don't have to do that anymore. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges when we first started launching a podcast in a news organization is to encourage your journalists that they want their stories to be told in audio. You know, all of our journalists have their stories in print all the time, but why should they take the time to sit down and record an interview with us? Something which can be quite stressful, it can be time consuming. And, you know, the way we talk to them about it is we sort of say that our podcast has a much bigger word count than an article you know they have to think about a bit more when they come to record a podcast um but i'm really pleased to say that over you know two years on lots of them have really really enjoyed working with us they now come to us with stories that they are thinking about for audio and we have some amazing people in our newsroom who are great storytellers and broadcasters people who we've worked with really hard to help them develop and i think a lot of people have realized that the brings their story to new audiences. There's something different about hearing the human voice tell a story, obviously, over having it written down. And I think especially for stories that are human interest or a, a, a maybe more emotional stories, you find it can resonate in a way that the printed word doesn't. So we've, we've done really well, I think, to, to get so many people on board 
exactly that. Um, each episode that we make has a basic structure. It's one interview usually with the journalist and that can change quite a lot. We may have three or four voices in there. We may interview somebody who's involved in the story. We may sometimes not use a journalist and do it ourselves, but mostly it's the journalists who come to us and we interview them for the story. And then we cut in archive sound effects and then edit it all down into sort of 20, 25 minutes. And then our sound designer takes it and Axel does his magic basically and makes it sound amazing. And we often get told by people that, you know, it's the sound design that makes it really compelling. You're having lovely bits of music just added throughout a story, I think can really help move it through and engage the audience in a way that it wouldn't if you didn't have it. Um, so we sort of work on a basis where we have a lot of stories pitched to us from journalists within the paper. We obviously cover the main stories The Guardian is writing about and then individual producers pitch stories too. So things that might be important to us or stories that um, perhaps you know, charities might have come to us about that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's a real mix of how we generate ideas. And since we moved home, that changed a lot because it's obviously harder to speak to journalists when you're not in the same room. And that's a challenge that we've had to overcome essentially. Um, but I think, I think we've managed to do that pretty well. Um, so I'm gonna get into now like how we choose the stories that we, we make and how we choose the stories for our podcast. And it is, quite a difficult balancing act um, to do that. And I think what makes a good story is obviously a matter of opinion, but what makes a good story for us is something that's quite clear, I think. It's obviously Guardian journalism leads that, but it's you know thinking about what your audience is interested in and thinking about what you can bring to them that they might not know about. And one of the most common pieces of feedback we get from listeners is I didn't know anything about this and now I feel I've really learned something. What we're trying to do here is tell people the news but not in a way that makes them feel stupid. It's in a way that makes them feel like they're learning something. You know you sort of want them to then go away and say to their friend oh did you hear this story and feel like they really know and are an authority on it um, which is what I do because I don't know much about specific things I know a lot about little things so that's what we're trying to do with the podcast so the first thing to say I think is it's about getting the balance right we have five episodes a week so over that week you have to have a good mix of stories we pick some that are domestic UK stories we always have some global news stories and we always try to have something in that which is a little bit lighter or something that isn't serious. You know, I remember when the pandemic started here last March, we obviously were covering it all the time. And a lot of people said to me, I can't listen at the moment. I'm finding it quite difficult because everything around us was so scary. And so we had to work to, to know how much we could tell people and how much we needed to offer them other stories to kind of take their minds off things sometimes. Um, so I've kind of tried to break down how we pick our stories. So the, the most obvious one is we do top line responsive news. And this will usually be episodes that we turn around in a day. So if we're releasing our episodes early in the morning, what usually happens is the edit will be handed to our sound designer the day before, and then they will finish it by the end of the day. And that might be an interview that was done a few days before or a week before. But when we do these responsive stories, we do it all in one day. So we get up early in the morning, we work out what our interview is, we do the interview and we get it edited in sound design. And it means it's quite a long day, but it means you can really be picking up on the latest. So with coronavirus, we've done a lot of these episodes to respond to when the government has made announcements here, when we learn something new about the virus. And this will usually just be a simple interview with one of our science correspondents about what they know and what they can tell us and our audience find these really helpful they're like explainer episodes you know sometimes day like 24-hour news can feel very overwhelming and I think to have a podcast that will take all the important bits of that 24-hour news and present it in one episode for you to have while you get up in the morning it's a nicer way and more 
a more human way, I think, of, of, of understanding what's going on. And then the other big story example of this um, for us in the UK over the past few years has been our leaving the European Union, which has been a huge story and will continue to be a big story. Um, but when we first launched, we did a lot of episodes where we covered the latest and that gave us a great opportunity to make episodes that were out and about. You know, we spent a lot of time down at our Houses of Parliament running around interviewing people and then trying to sending all the audio back to the office and the producers cutting together to make it sound as sort of live and exciting as possible because uh, Brexit was a complicated story. It was really hard for even journalists to understand. So being able to reflect the kind of political excitement and all the different deal-making and conversations that were happening was a good way, I think, of getting people engaged. So you'd have, Anushka would be, you know, getting down to the Houses of Parliament in a taxi and we would be recording her and saying, you know, what's going on? And then she'd be running around the Houses of Parliament trying to speak to politicians. And, you know, it's a, it's a good example of how you can make a story feel really live, even though you're playing it out the next day. Um, and we also have done um, quite a few overnight episodes on elections. So we've had um, a couple of elections here, obviously the US election last year. When we're covering those events, a team of people will stay up all night and we'll be pulling audio and doing interviews all night and trying to put something together. Obviously in the case of the US election, there wasn't a result when we put the podcast out in the morning. So sometimes you're putting something out, which is a sort of wait and see, um, but it's a good way, I think, of again, giving people the latest. Um, then we also cover big world stories. So um, it's always really important that some of our best content because it's stories about countries that some of our audience really don't know a lot about. Um, so recently we did a big episode about the farmers protests in India, which has obviously been a huge story there. And we had a correspondent um, who went to one of the camps and she recorded loads of audio in one of the protest camps. And we, it was really lovely. We got to hear like all of those voices and you know what it sounded like. And we were able to take our audience right into the camp um, we've also covered the imprisonment of Alexei Navalny in Russia from our correspondent who was in the court when he was sentenced, that he gave us a really dramatic description of what happened. Um, and we've been covering the elections in Uganda. So a really wide range of different stories. And I personally love making those because I learn so much and all of our correspondents are amazing at getting out and, and capturing those, those moments. And it is an opportunity, as I say, to talk about other aspects of those countries, like their history, culture, things that people just wouldn't know. And one of the biggest challenges for us is sometimes when you come to a story about, say, a country like Uganda, which a lot of people in the UK don't know much about, there is a temptation to tell the whole history of that country to explain what is happening today. So you have to be very good at picking what you think people need to know to understand what is happening without giving them all that background because it would just take too long we only have 25 minutes and that's one of the most difficult things about making this podcast is getting everything you want to in in 25 sort of we edge up to 30 minutes sometimes because you just can't cut stuff it's too important um obviously a big focus for us is doing sort of human stories and I cannot say enough how important it is to have a good character at the centre of your story. If you're trying to tell a story which is difficult for people to understand or difficult for people to empathise with, if you have a, a person at the centre of it who I think people can really connect with, that will just help you so much. So a good example of this is we did an episode a couple of years ago about pollution levels in Delhi, something which I think a lot of people are aware of, that Delhi is a very polluted city. And our correspondent, Michael Safi, who's amazing, um, worked with a rickshaw driver called Pandit and they put an air quality monitor on his trip. And Pandit was an amazing character. He was a great storyteller and they discovered how polluting Delhi was for him to work in. And, you know, it just brought so much warmth and you really felt for the driver and it really made you want that 
situation to change in a way that if you just told people what was happening, it wouldn't have done it in the same way. Um, another one that we did, which was amazing, was about a crew of um, sailors who had been abandoned um, off Dubai uh, without any pay by the contractor that owned the ship. And they had been at sea on this boat for months and months, holding out until they got paid. And we spoke to the captain of that ship, Captain Ayapan, who was a fantastic character. And it was really difficult to interview him because there was no internet. And this is a great tip, I think. If you are struggling to interview somebody and they don't have any internet, we often use WhatsApp voice notes. So we will get people to record voice notes and I will record a voice note back to them and then we will edit it up. And it can take a really long time, but if you're interviewing someone who is on a boat where there is no connection, that's one way we've worked out to do it. And we did it again last year with somebody who was trapped on a cruise ship because of course all the cruise ships were grounded after the pandemic. Um, so characters, people, voices, if you can find someone to put at the center of your story, if you feel like it's a bit dry, then trying to find someone at the center of it is, is really good. Um, and I said earlier, we try to do light and fun stories. This is a real challenge for us. Um, it's difficult to find new stories that are light and fun without them sounding too patronizing or without it sounding too forced. Um, but I think one example of this I'll give you quickly that we did last year was we made two episodes about dating in the pandemic. And we actually sent a group of our listeners on blind date. Um, and we set them up and recorded them uh, on Zoom and then played the audio for our audience. And I think it was one of the most popular podcasts that we ever did. All of the couples were great. Um, two of them are still together, actually, which is lovely. Um, and it was a really clever way of looking at an aspect of life, you know, the struggle of making intimate connections in the pandemic and working out how we could make our own story out of it um so that was a really good example that was my colleague hannah who came up with that idea and, and it's it's a, a really fun episode to listen to and it was a really fun one to sound design as well and i loved presenting that one um, and it's also about if you've just if you can find somebody who's a really fun interviewee or a really engaging storyteller we made an episode last year about the world's most expensive painting which is the salvatore mundi by leonardo da vinci and we told the story of how it became the most expensive painting. Uh, and it was with a fantastic arts writer who wasn't a Guardian writer, but came from outside the organisation. And he was just fun and he loved the story and he brought all the characters to life. And that's a great story. I mean, I think that's those are really good ones. And another genre that fits into lighter stories, but still important, uh, we find are talking about tech stories. So getting people to understand how WhatsApp works or TikTok, why are these things so big and who owns them? You know, things that are like aspects of our daily lives that most of us just don't know anything about. And honestly, when we're coming up with ideas for the podcast, often it's just things that we've personally been thinking about. Like, I don't understand how that thing works or why has that happened? And I think go by your instinct when you're choosing what you're going to talk about. I think what you're interested in often will be what other people are interested in. You get a feel for it. Um, and my last point is when we pick stories, like the thing that will win us over with everything else is good audio. If a journalist has gone and collected really good recordings for us, then we will do that story because it, it will probably always work. So we're mostly at the moment getting people just to record on their iPhones just or on their voice notes app. And one of my colleagues went to a hospital a couple of months ago to talk about the COVID crisis here. And she just recorded for hours on her phone. And then we took hours of audio and went through it and interviewed her separately and then wove all that audio in to her interview. And it just brought it to life. And it's a really, really simple way of, you know, lifting a podcast and really giving people an insight. So that's how we pick our stories and how, and I've talked a little bit there about how we also make them engaging. Um, and I talked earlier about the question 
that we ask at the beginning of our episodes. And it's not always a question, it's sometimes a statement. But I think when you are thinking about why you're making a podcast episode, you need to ask yourself why you're making it and, and, and why you want to do it. And is there, in our case, we're like, is there a question that we want to answer? And, you know, our name is Today in Focus. So we're trying to have a focus in each of our episodes. And, you know, it can be difficult when you're tackling huge topics. I mean, we're, we're trying to make an episode at the moment about the way the pandemic here has affected disabled people in the UK. And that is an enormous topic because there's so many different stories within that. So how in 25 minutes are we going to focus that? And so at the moment, we're working out what that question will be. And that will be a process between a few people. Like it's very collaborative what we do. It's never one person making something. It's always three or four on an episode. And it's really useful just to knock ideas around and talk about that. But a big sort of driver of how we make our podcast is thinking about the audience. And I think that's so important. Like, who is listening to this? Who do you want to listen to this? Who do you want to hear it? And what do they need to know? And we're quite lucky because we primarily are listened to firstly by Guardian readers that gives us a good sense of the kind of person that's listening and their political leanings for example but we also have a huge number of people who've come to us who don't read the guardian we have a, a young audience that's why podcasts are so appealing because younger people tend to listen to them um, and so one of the things we talk about constantly is how much we need to explain things to people so all the way through making an episode we have to decide how much the presenters need to explain stuff and how much the reporters do. And that's a really important thing to think about is what level you're setting your stories. I mean, if you're making a specific podcast for an audience that already knows a lot, then that's fine. I mean, you know how to, to set your information level. Um, but what we try to do, as I say, is we're trying to explain stuff as well as tell you what's going on. So we will often do that through um, obviously our reporters, but through scripting. And that's a really important thing to establish. Um, I mean, if we've already made a podcast about say a particular country, we might decide the next time we make another one about that country, we can afford to explain a bit less and we refer people back to the other podcast. Um, so it's, it's quite a difficult balance, I think, to work out what people know because you don't want to be patronizing, but you also don't want to be too confusing. Um, and this is really challenging when you work on episodes that you yourself struggle to understand. Like we made one recently about Bitcoin and I am very confused about Bitcoin, um, but <laughs> we did try and explain it. And I think it helped make sense. So yeah, it's, it's not always easy. Some things take a while to get your head round. And I think the key thing is having a reporter who's a really good storyteller and our tech editor, Alex Hearn, had some really good analogies to help us understand Bitcoin. Um, I think when you're talking about finance and tech particularly, that can get confusing for people. So we, we go from quite a low level of understanding for that sort of thing. Um, the tone of how you tell stories is a really important thing to get right, to make them engaging, as well as working out what level of understanding you think people have. I just think the key thing is to keep stuff simple. And our tone is very much like we want people to feel like the presenters are journalists who know things, but we're also, but we're friendly. You know, the, the kind of way we think about it is we, it's conversational. We're kind of exploring the subject with you, but we're, we're doing it in a really friendly way. So I think that the tone is really important. And I think, that will come from scripting. Like when you're, like writing for art for audio is really different from writing for print. Like I would be a terrible print writer because I'm used to just writing short bits of script. And, you know, sometimes you can be really creative with it. And, you know, you might need to be very descriptive to take people to a place. Often I just try and, as I say, keep things really simple with my script and, not overcomplicate things and not try to use too many like big words just to make yourself sound clever. I think you know, when I'm asking people questions, you know, one of the easiest questions to ask is just why. And another question, you know, that 
often everyone thinks this is a bad interview question, but asking someone, how do you feel, is sometimes just a really important thing to know. And I think that often in news reporting, that's not what you hear from stories. It, it's definitely changing. But I always remember being down at our Houses of Parliament a few years ago in the middle of all of the Brexit chaos and one of the politicians stormed out of a, of a meeting and Anushka asked him, how do you feel right now? And he just looked really confused and said, what do you mean? And he didn't know how to feel. He didn't think about that in the moment. But that is kind of what you want to know, I think, when these things are happening. Um, so I think thinking about the tone and the way you ask questions, if it's an interview podcast, is really important. And as I say, like developing the character of your presenters really, really helps. So Anushka has been presenting this for quite a long time now and listeners have a real connection with you if you work on a podcast. It's, you know, very intimate medium, isn't it? You know, you're listening in your ears every day to this person. And so every podcast, like Anushka and I will often maybe add something personal in a personal view or a personal story, or we might say something to make somebody laugh or, you know, we might laugh. Like it's all about making it sound like a conversation, even though you've, you already know what the questions are. You've talked to that person probably before, but you want to, you know, in the moment, you know, you're trying to have a live conversation and, and that's what we're, we're doing all the time. And, you know, now people really, you have to get people to trust you as the voice. And I think that's a really good way of them engaging. You know, I talked about earlier, having a central character in your story. Well, often your presenter can be your character. If your presenter is good at, you know, connecting with people and your audience has a real sense of who they are, then it will give people faith in the way they're telling that story. And I think it will make people sort of want to come back for more of that reporting. Um, and just sort of two other things that are just are really important in terms of style for us is the role that we use archive in our stories. So collecting tape that will help illustrate a story is really important. And we have some producers who are just amazing at doing this. You know, if you're telling a historical story, you might want to spend quite a lot of time going back through archives to find tape to help build that story. Um, and, you know, sometimes your archive can honestly make your podcast. I mean, when we've done stories about politicians here, maybe politicians doing stupid things, you know, if you've got the archive of them doing those stupid things, that will be the thing that makes your podcast. And so we often use archive. It, it's, it's a huge, important thing of what we do. Um, and we find this from news sources, from YouTube, you know, all sorts of places. So thinking about, can you find clips that can support what you're talking about or in fact, add to what you're talking about. You know, if you're talking about um, Donald Trump, for example, you'll end up using lots of Donald Trump clips to help people really get a sense of what he did. You know, when he made that speech at the Capitol um, and earlier this year, which of, of course led to those huge events, we did an episode all about that and we played the speech and analyzed it with our reporter as we went. So you really do need to think about archive. I mean, when we're doing our very quick episodes, it's not a priority, but if you've got a nice long piece, then it definitely works. <clears throat> um, and then as well, sound design is really important. As I say, the music can really help you engage in a piece. And sound design is a whole world in itself. And I'm sure it's going to be something that's talked about um, at this festival too, but it's, it's a really important thing to get right. And, um, you know, when you're listening to podcasts, really listen to what the music is and where they're using it and when they put it in, because I think that that's something that people often forget about, but it is really important. Um, and this is just finally, because I know we'll want to get to questions and things soon, just the challenge of complicated news stories. Um, you know, I've talked about the general areas that we focus on, but sometimes you do get stories which are really difficult to tell. And the key thing is in-depth journalistic investigations, stories that people have taken months and years to try and uncover, where there's loads of documentation and that sort of thing. Um, and one of these recently that we've covered here in the UK is our investigations team found that our Queen, Queen Elizabeth, 
has been interfering in the way that we make laws in this country a lot more than people might have realised. Um, and this was a huge in-depth investigation that involved lots of paperwork, lots of pouring through archives. And the way that we managed to cover it is because we have an amazing journalist called David Pegg, who is a really good storyteller. He's really fun. He loves these kinds of stories. He's obsessed with them. And again, when you're telling investigative stories, um, often they can be really dry. Like if it's about money and banking and, you know, legislation. So having characters at the centre of it, like the Queen, who in our country, there's no one more famous than the Queen. You know, if you have someone at the centre of it who people know and understand, you know, and we started that episode with loads of sounds of royal ceremonies and all that kind of thing. We got people to engage in why they needed to be interested in it. Um, and just before I finish, I'll tell you about one big project that we have just completed here, which is an example of how we're now moving, I think, into a new area of storytelling. And that is with um, this brand new series that we have um, called Freshwater, which has just, well, well, actually it's still going. So it's a five part series. This is something we've wanted to do for a while. We don't do series yet, particularly on Today in Focus, but we've really wanted to create a standalone series within what we do for a while. And Freshwater is a five part series. It's about, it's an amazing story. It's about five fishermen who over a decade ago were sentenced to a total of 104 years in prison after millions of pounds of cocaine were diverting in a bay called Freshwater off the coast of the UK, off an island called the Isle of Wight. And all of the men maintain that they're completely innocent. And the series is investigating that case and the appeal in that case. And the appeal is currently ongoing in the courts here. So we will find out soon the results of that. But it was a really clever series because it's an incredibly complicated case and it involves lots of interviews with lawyers about very little bits of evidence. And my colleague Josh Kelly and Anushka worked on this for months and they made it interesting in a really clever way. They used so much script, much more than we usually would. Anushka really took, was, was putting her personal touch to it basically, kept saying, I don't know whether this is true or this is true, but you know, it really kept you engaged. And um, yeah, I think if you want to hear an example of how you can take quite detailed things and make people really gripped by them, and the way they did it is they segmented up the appeal case into really small themes and made each episode a theme. So you really focused on different aspects of the appeal for each episode. And it meant at the end of each one, you kept changing your mind about whether these men are guilty or innocent. And honestly, I've listened to five episodes and I still don't know. So I think that's probably a good, a good thing. Um, Rachel, right, are we, we are having, a lot. Oh yeah, you have a thank, thank you note. So. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Sorry, I've just talked at everybody for a really long time. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm done basically. Yeah. Great, thanks so much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I also learned a lot about uh, Today in Focus, a really interesting podcast. Um, we have um, several questions in the chat uh, and I will start from the first question. Um, how many people you have in your team? I remember you showed our, us the photo and I counted like 11 people on the photo. <laughs> but yeah. uh, they are asking about how many people in your team? Yeah, I think it's like um, about 10 people, 10 or 11, but I should say we have lots of um, freelancers who work with us too. So we have, a, a, and also, I mean, we have all of, you know, the journalists that we work with, but our core team that make the podcast every day, there's 10 of us. So that's um, two executives, two um, presenters, a sound designer, and then five producers as well because we're working on episodes all the time. Um, so yes, that's how many people we have. It's quite, people think it's quite a big team, but I tell you, it's, it's not enough sometimes. Yes. Um, great. Um, another uh, second question was about, um, so your, each podcast episode is about 20 minutes, as you said, um, and how you choose, uh, do you choose one theme for the whole podcast or do you choose several themes which, you'll, which you will talk about in the podcast? How you, how you manage to choose themes? 
Yes, so we will pick one story and then we will pick what we tell of that story because 25 minutes is actually not very long and it is really difficult um, to choose. And so every interview goes through lots of edits. So someone will do a first edit and then we will do second, maybe third edits. Like lots of people will listen to them. I would say maybe three or four people will listen to each episode before it goes out. And also a big part of our team I haven't mentioned as well is every single episode is listened to by a lawyer which is really important. <laughs> I can't say enough how important that is, especially on our big series we've just done. Like the lawyer becomes a producer actually in lots of ways because we can't put it out if it's illegal. So. Oh, I think we lost you, Rachel, or is it my problem? No, I think it's something with Rachel. Okay. Oh, I hope she comes back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe it's better for you, her to re-enter Zoom. <laughs> oh, oh, hello, are you back? Uh, Rachel, hello. We, we, Something wrong with you. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, probably it's my very bad London internet, which is very weak. Um, sorry, was there another question? So it happens also in London, people worrying. Oh, the internet here is terrible. We have awful internet. Yeah, the yeah. UK has very bad internet provision. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's maybe a sec uh, the next question. Um, so people are asking about the differences between your popular stories on the website, on the Guardian's website, and uh, on popular stories on podcasts. I think they are meaning about podcast platforms. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of yeah. views and feedback, do you choose, do you have a strategy of like which podcast you're putting on that? And what, what, is, what are the views on, and feedbacks? Yeah. So we uh, tend to choose partly on what some of our journalists, as I say, are really good storytellers. So we often go back to use them again. But there definitely is crossover between what is popular with the paper and what is popular on the podcast. So we have, for example, a writer called John Crace, who's very, very funny. And he comes on the podcast and is very, very funny. And people love him. I mean, he's just a sort of celebrity at The Guardian. So he's really popular. But some stories on the podcast resonate so much more with us than in print. So I told you about the ship that was abandoned at sea. You know, that was a, a story that went in the paper and it didn't, you know, have a big impact but it was so well listened to, our audience loved it. And I actually got quite a big response. And actually after that, the crew managed to get off the boat. And I think the owner of the boat heard the podcast and was a bit worried. So we can have an impact in a way that print can't. Um, and in terms of feedback that we get from um, listeners, I think, as I say, people love that it comes on every day and they can just listen to it while they're doing other things. They love that they can um, learn a new thing every day and that they can learn it in a way that's easy to understand. Uh, they love that we, they love our lighter stories. They love our stories where we um, talk about things that are happening in their lives. So like today, our episode is about being single at the moment, which is not easy for lots of people. And I've already had loads of messages saying, thank you for telling this story. Um, so yeah, it's a real, range but I think in general people just find it really factually helpful and really useful for learning more about the world everyone says it like broadens my understanding of the world and I think at a time you know where lots of us are not going anywhere at the moment it's important to tell those stories particularly and make people feel like they're going somewhere you know we've tried to get our journalists to collect so much audio this year if they're in other countries because you know, I think that's quite important. Yeah, I think I agree with you a bit because podcasts can be really helpful during lockdowns and like social isolation because you can hear the voices and podcast has a different impact rather than text or like audio. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's helped me. It's nice for me to be here and be able to record. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's, and you and to get feedback, you know, a woman tweeted me the other day and she sent me a picture of where she listens to the podcast and it was in a snowy forest in Norway 
Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I'm glad my voice goes somewhere, even if I don't. That's yeah. nice. That's great. So <laughs> the next question is about, um, what, so when you talk about, uh, you talked about involvement, uh, like, and being equal, on equal level with the audience mm -hmm. and friendliness. And uh, what do you mean exactly by this and involvement of listeners into the conversation in, in the live like format when, when you do it online? Yeah, so we um, we do engage with listeners quite a lot and we definitely have engaged more. We're quite responsive to what people tell us. So when we get feedback, we definitely take it on board and think about it for our next episodes. Um, I suppose what I meant by the friendliness is you, you do want to feel you do what make you do want to make your listeners feel like you're sharing stuff with them you're not telling them stuff in the way that a news bulletin does you know if you listen to a news yeah. reporter they kind of tell you things in this certain tone yes and news language is quite weird i think like and and the way that people you know reporters voices will go like this sometimes it's quite yeah. strange so what we're trying to do is is tell the same things, but in a a way that's like, as I say, like a conversation. And I think actually, you know, we have quite a lot of engagement with our listeners, mainly through Twitter. Anushka and I spend quite a lot, probably too much time on Twitter. Um, and that's how we engage with our audiences, but also email. And, you know, I try to talk, I meet people a lot who, li who listen. It's really nice actually. and. I always, you know, and if any of you do listen again, like always just want people to give us feedback and tell us things that they don't like. You know, I always want to know what don't you like about something. In podcasting, we talk a lot about the podcast we like. I want to talk about podcasts we don't like too, because I think it's a good way for the medium to develop. Um, and one of my personal like things here in the UK is podcast reviews. They always tell us what good podcasts are, but sometimes I want to know what people didn't like too. So yeah, we, we do engage with our audience quite a lot, but I think we could always do it more. Um, thanks so much. Uh, I just posted your Twitter in the chat, so maybe other interest, interested audience will be follow, following you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, very addicted to Twitter, so I'm very <laughs> always there. Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. Um, another qu a question about the themes as well. Um, so you are fitting the like large, conversations into like 25 minutes and are there any other resources apart from the podcast where you keep the material that you didn't include in the podcast because you think it's really important but you can't include it <laughs> but you have other websites or like anything other <laughs> yeah no we we don't do that no i was laughing sorry because there are outtakes that sometimes i like to keep for myself but uh <laughs> sort of silly things but no we we don't it's um it's purely it's purely what we put up um and we do we i mean this is not really the same thing we often we have occasionally we replay episodes so for example we we take breaks a couple of times in the year so at christmas we replayed all our favorite episodes and back in the summer we did a special week of black lives matter episodes to talk about race and racism so we reuse our content but we don't we don't put it anywhere else actually what you hear is what we make pretty much and everything else is just on the cutting room floor essentially okay um understood yeah um a really interesting question about uh, podcasting in central asia because it's a really an emerging kind of i would say market i don't know uh, it's not like in the uk it's like enormous market of podcasts but uh the question is uh, what kind of topics or themes would would be most relevant uh, to the most part of the world? Like, despite the geographic location, what do you think would be relevant for Central Asia, taking into your account your experience? Well, I think if this is what you're saying, if you were wanting to tell stories about Central Asia that you felt you wanted a wider audience to understand, I think this comes back to what I was saying about human interest and character. I think if you have a good character, that is a universal thing that people can connect with. And I think that hearing about someone's personal story 
if it's something that is might be sad or it might be a difficult story or maybe it's just really funny everybody can connect with that um i also think yeah like stories about um you know also just stories that are just a bit weird sometimes i think people will be really interested in like we did one years ago about an american guy who had gone to an island in India which was only inhabited off India which is only inhabited by a tribe and he was killed on that island and it was just a crazy story and I know that there are amazing stories in Central Asia because I, I read them and there's some incredible stories that you know are just fascinating and I think that if you have a story about Central Asia which is is just you know compelling has got those ingredients maybe a bit of mystery I mean, mystery is great. That was why our painting episode did so well about the big book, because it's a mystery. You know, you want to find out what happened. So I think, you know, true crime has been well covered in the podcast market in the UK. I don't know about Central Asia, whether you've had your true crime moment yet, but it's obviously in the West, in, in like America, in the UK, it's huge. And there are true crime podcasts coming out all the time. So that's a very popular genre. Um, but as I say, I think the human interest story, I think if you can find yourself a good character with an interesting story to tell, make that podcast and, and, and do it, because I think it would be great. Okay. And um, maybe one of the last questions, because we still have a couple of minutes left. Um, what are the mistakes when you start making new podcasts? Did, <laughs> did you have any mistakes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can Yeah, share. of course. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one that I remember was um, I tried to make I tried to make an episode about a really complicated court case here, and it was um, it was it was a very sad story. It was about child abuse, and I went along to the case, and I was completely gripped by it. But it was a really difficult one to tell, and the the episode just wasn't great in the end. There actually wasn't a great story, even though there was a sad a sad aspect to it. And so I think what I would say is if you if you feel like you're having to really work to make something good and it's it's not going anywhere, maybe change it would be my advice. I mean, especially like us, if you're working to tight deadlines, sometimes you just have to say, right, we're not going to do it. Um, and also, I would say, like, yeah, I mean, we definitely we definitely made mistakes 100 percent. And I think. It's, it's all about experimenting and working out the kind of stories. I think also don't overcomplicate things. Like we definitely have, have got too many voices in a piece. And when you're interviewing someone about their personal story, you then really feel like you, you honor that person. And so if you then get to the point in the edit where you're like, oh, I don't have time to have all these voices, you feel really bad because you, know, you, you want to tell this person's story. So you know, and then you can end up with too much tape. And so those things are all things you learn to work out. And it just, you know, so when you come to plan something, like often now, you know, we might get to a story and we'll just say, right, let's just have one voice. Let's just keep it simple. And that will be a good way of doing it. It is a balance between how well you want to tell the story or how you want to tell the story and how much time you have to tell it. And that's something that we are juggling with all the time. And I think we've got a lot better and what I will say is the first year of the podcast I wasn't finishing work very early put it that way uh, <laughs> but that's got better okay thanks so much Rachel this is really um, insightful and very useful for um, start uh, st uh, podcasters in Central Asia so um, and at this note I, I think I will thank you again and thank everyone who participated in this session uh, we, sh we are ending sharply at half past nine by the UK time, by, <laughs> <laughs> by the UK time, yes, yeah, nine thirty, three thirty with with you guys. And um, thank you so yeah, much, everybody, for coming. And thank you for the questions. It's been a real honour, and I'm very excited to see where podcasting goes in Central Asia. And I would love to come in person one day. That would be like my dream. I just go to so yes. yeah, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for organising. Yes. Thank you for your hosting. You are very welcome to Central Asia. Always, yeah, thank you. Oh.